there are times when I just want to sit back and relax and fully engage myself in a piece of music. To de-stress from the day, to forget about all the worries or things that might be on my mind. And the piece of music I've chosen today is absolutely perfect for that. It's a string quartet written in 1772 by Joseph Haydn. And for many people, it has the effect or a similar effect as maybe Miles Davis is a kind of blue. It's calming, it's relaxing, it's very, very beautiful. It's in four movements and each movement has its own little character. And you can enjoy it just to let it like waves wash over you. But as you start to listen, as you start to engage, it pulls you in, in a way that's quite remarkable. But in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about the piece, like I have just now. A little bit about Haydn, because it's a funny story. His life uh, is quite a a amazing. And then I'm going to play you six different versions of this piece. We're going to just drop in and out, and very contrasting versions from six different string quartets so that you can familiarize yourself with it if you haven't, if you don't know it already, and just hopefully just enjoy these comparisons and come to your own conclusion about which one you prefer the most. And sometimes it's going to be a decision over sound quality, even over maybe performance. But that, that comes later. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about Haydn, Joseph Haydn, Franz Joseph Haydn. Born in 1732 in a little rural village in Austria. And at the age of six, his father um, sent him away, or well, you sent him away is probably a bit difficult. They were a very poor family. His father was a wheelwright and also a folk musician. And there was a lot of music in the house, apparently singing and whatever. But at the age of six, they noticed that Haydn, Joseph Haydn had very, very particular skills that were coming to the front in music and they had a relative who lived in a, di in a different city who um, kindly took him in so he was sent away and he never returned to his family home at the age of from the age of six and there he was brought into a choir and he learned something about music but not a lot and during the rest of his next few years um, he went to various choir schools and in fact it's here it seems clear to me that Joseph Haydn was had a sense of humor and was often playing tricks and there was one famous trick where he cut the choir boy's ponytail off and got into terrible trouble in fact he was caned for doing so and thrown out of the choir and literally thrown out onto the streets and here he had to think very quickly for himself and luckily a friend of his took him in to their garret apartment with I think there was lots of people living there so hunger was something that Haydn definitely knew and he had to earn his living from thence on as a kind of street musician a street singer and so he had to develop the skills of luring people in wowing them with his voice and with his music and in doing so over the years he, he managed to get a few jobs and um Really, by the time he was 25, he was becoming employed by sort of nobility in, in the area at that time. And by the time he was 28, he was employed by one of the most biggest and powerful houses in Austria, which is that of the Esterhazys. And there he worked for 18 years, um, most of his time spent outside of Vienna, away from uh, the hustle and bustle in a very rural location, which also became a problem later on, as we saw. But by, you know, by the 1890s, he was, a, even 1880s, 1890s, he was really a, a, a very 
well-established uh, composer. He had, he had changed his contract. He was a very good negotiator. He had changed his contract with the Esterhazy. still worked for them, but they allowed him to travel to London, which he did on a number of occasions. He became a massive hit there. Um, and actually, he earned quite a lot of money. As far as his love life was concerned, that wasn't very happy at all, as far as we can see. It was certainly not his official marriage. Um, I believe it was in 1780. Uh, let me just check that he actually got married. Um, what am I talking about? 1760. What am I talking about? Uh, age 28, he married um, Maria Anna. And she was the older sister. He had four years earlier or four or five years earlier fallen in love with her younger sister, Teresa. But she was destined for the nunnery, it seems, for the religion. I don't know quite how that worked, but it seems like you sort of pledged a child to a religious order. Anyway, that was uh, Teresa's lot. And um, so he ended up marrying Mariana. And it wasn't it wasn't a happy marriage. It was they didn't have um, any children. He took on a lover, she took on a lover. And it, yeah, he, I think most of his time was spent uh, composing, to be honest, because he was a prolific composer. I mean, he wrote 104 symphonies, Beethoven 9, Mozart 41, I believe. He wrote 104, um, 12 in London or 12 for London, for sure. Um, he wrote 68 string quartets, of which we are just going to study one of them. He wrote countless oratorios and operas, over 400 songs. It just goes on and on and on. Amazing. Check it out how much he composed in his time. But he ended his lifetime quite well off and bought himself a house in Vienna. Um, and then would sort of commute from there to the Esterhazy still, right up to his, his, you know, dying years, to be honest. So that's a little bit about um, Joseph Haydn. Um, and now let's talk a little bit about the string quartet itself. It's I've chosen out of all the 68, um, the first one from Opus 20, it's number five. Now, this is confusing and it's, it's something that comes back a lot in string quartets. He numbered them probably out of out of sequence. So what happened was the number five was his the one he intended to be first of a set of six. And this was a, a later set. Uh, as I say, it was written in, in 1777, if I remember correctly. Um, and this quartet is broken into four movements and the four movements I'll come back to in a minute, but I think it's important to understand that this was really the beginning of Haydn as a real innovator in terms of string quartets. There was a major leap in Opus 20 in these six, and that major leap was the fact that he was giving the cello an equal voice. So the string quartet is basically two violins, a viola and a cello. And often it was like a trio with a little bit of filling in from the bass, basso continuo. Bach studied a lot of CPE Bach, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach. And also this elementary understanding, more fundamental understanding, what am I saying, of, of, of Bach's music and the fugue, that had been really falling out of popularity by the time that Haydn was writing this piece in 1777. And, you know, no one was writing them. The classical era was in and no one was kind of writing this style. And he brought it back with a gusto. And it's something that was later going to be picked up, certainly by Beethoven in a very big way in his Grossa Fugue, which we'll probably talk about in a later talk. So, um, Another thing I want to mention is that Haydn and Mozart met, they became friends, um, they collaborated together for fun, and 10 years after this quartet was written, Mozart wrote his own set of six quartets which he dedicated to Haydn. And they're known as the Haydn Quartets. And that's a bit weird, really, because if you're going out looking for a CD, 
and you, you see these Mozart quartets and it says the word Haydn on it, it can be very confusing. But yes, he dedicated the six to, to Haydn and I strongly recommend listening to those. Now, let's get to the six uh, quartets that I've chosen. Um, I know there are so many to choose from, but I wanted a mix between current um, quartets uh, and also some historical ones. So the first quartet I want to talk about is the Dudoc uh, Quartet from Amsterdam, or the Dudoc Quartet, Amsterdam as they're known. The recording I've chosen is made in 2019 and um, it's recorded in Studio One in the Music Centrum van de Omroep in Hilversum. A really, really nice studio uh, with a good acoustic. Um, the second one uh, is the Emerson Quartet, a really famous quartet, uh, recorded on Deutsche Grammophon label in 2001, part of the Haydn project. And it was recorded in Le Frac Hall in Queens College, New York. So quite a, quite a difference between these two. And then I, I chose the Lindsays. As I was growing up or as a teenager, the Lindsays were a very, very popular string quartet. And this is a one from 1999 on the SV label. And um, it won a gramophone award, a, a British magazine, uh, for highly renowned for its uh, music critics. Um, the Lindsays were founded in 1965 and disbanded in 2005. So this 1999 recording depicts uh, a recording quite late in their career. So it's a, a very mature Lindsays you're listening to. Then we've got the Pro Arte Quartet from 1932. <laughs> and this is recorded in Abbey Road on the, on the Parlophone label. And it's part of Warner Classics now. But it's an incredible recording Obviously, it's, it's not the best quality recording, uh, being from 1932, but listening to it, you get to understand, actually, they were quite modern for their time, or maybe we have not changed much since then. But you, you can listen to that for yourself. And then we've got the Chiaroscuro Quartet. Now, there's a lot of different ways, and everybody criticises my pronunciation, but I believe the Italians pronounce it Chiaroscuro or Chiascuro, and the English tend to call it Chiascuro, so you have to decide how you want to pronounce it. But it's a Chiascuro Quartet, and this was recorded in 2015, so it's similar to the Dudot Quartet, and it's a BIS recording, a really very high quality recording, and it's recorded in Bremen in Germany, and it's an, also available as an SACD and, and a high definition uh, recording. And then the, the last quartet I want to talk about, and I'll feature them later on in this um, video, is the Jerusalem Quartet. And they recorded theirs in 2009, and it was released on 2011 by Har Har um, Harmonia Mundi. A really, really very good um, label, to be honest with you. It, it's um, very high quality recordings. But let's get started. And to kick off, I thought I would choose the, the, the Dudok Quartet, Amsterdam. And you will notice here in the opening of the first movement, which is an, uh, an allegro moderato, which just means moderately fast, usually it has a beat per minute somewhere between 120, 170, probably around 140. Um, but notice in this recording, if you're listening to the sound, first of all, the nice reverberation, and you could I could tell by looking at the microphone placements from the photographs I've seen of the recording that they're using the hall for this natural reverberation and it uses the, the hall's acoustics and dynamics very well. It's a 24-bit recording recorded at 96 kilohertz. It's a very fine quality but let's just get started. Enjoy. <laughs> Now the thing you'll notice 
this very, very beautiful playing, and it's very, very, very precise. But you'll notice too that Haydn is putting a lot of pauses, silences into this number five quartet. And you'll see that comes back and each string quartet has to choose how they're going to play that. See? Very fine playing. You see what I mean? It's a beautiful thing, and this is where we're going to now take you on to the next further. So that's the doodog quartet lovely very precise very very clean playing and as we'll see later on we'll, we'll come back and we'll listen to some other bits and pieces uh, from them we'll take some other clips in later on but they've just got a very nice purity of sound let's go now to the emerson quartet because i think the emerson to be honest with you they are should we say the most experienced there, or not the most experienced, but certainly the most famous quartet. This is Deutsche Grammophon. Listen to the sound here. It's giving the acoustics a, a, a bigger, more like they're playing in an empty hall, which is probably what they are doing. It's not excessive, but sometimes when I'm recording quartets and chamber music, I do like to go for the small halls here so you don't get too much echo. Decide for yourself if it's too much or nice. put their emphasis on that last note bum bum ba and here they're mixing it up a lot we're even putting a bit of syncopation in here Again, it's very, very precise stuff, but, but quite different in character from the Doodog, don't you think? OK, now we're going to move to the Lindsay's. And the Lindsay's has this a much shorter echo. It's got very nice spacing with the cellos in the mix. Uh, the cello is mixed in a bit further. It's not so obvious in the first movement, but you're definitely very obvious in the last movement when we get to that, the fugue at the end. Um, let's just listen to the Lindsay's and see what you think of this. You, forward aren't they in in the mix there's still plenty of echo there and there's a nicer reverberation i think is probably a better word than an echo in that respect um but it's it's well there 
it's an older recording. You can hear that it's an older recording. Sounds older. And I don't know why, because, it, you know, it's not that old. What well, did I say it was? 1999? The... Yeah, 1999, so it's not that old. But now we're going to go back to 1932, and we're going to be with the Pro Arte. Now, you've got to try and ignore all the hisses and crackles, because this is 32. Um, I guess it's on shellac. I don't think it's going to be on a cylinder in 32. But it's listen to how well separated all the instruments are. Now, I hope my room microphone is going to pick this up it's it's a bit difficult to be honest to get a good stereo signal in this room and mix that in with my voice but um see how you get on but what is interesting it's mono but you will hear every single instrument nicely separated not left and right of course but they're separated and your brain fills in the missing bits it's absolutely i find it absolutely fascinating and people who love mono really know this they understand this Funny, but when you listen to this, you can uh, very quickly forget about the recording. It's quite strange. Maybe not if you're tired and you want to just relax and sit back and listen to music. Maybe that isn't the version that you would choose. But it's interesting to study it and listen to it nonetheless. Now, the fifth quartet, the Chioscuro Quartet, this is really, really interesting, and I have to warn you, because they're playing on really original instruments, or sort of ancient instruments, with ancient bows, historical bows, historical instruments, and they're playing with gut strings, not metal strings, and that's a massive difference. Um, but also the pitch is lower. I don't know exactly, I haven't tested it, but I, and I haven't got perfect pitch either, but I'm guessing it's probably going to be 432 rather than 440 or 441 even so so i'm warning you in advance it's going to sound very strange but listen to this as an opening <laughs> of this playing is really really good but the instruments demand a very different approach and um, you can think that okay that maybe the intonation isn't exactly on but it is really it's just how it is on an in on a traditional instrument um, it takes a lot of getting used to but I promise you if you stick with it and just listen to that version right the way through your brain adapts to it now and, and here we've got an, uh, an extreme comparison because here it's also they've taken quite a slow pace as well haven't they compared to the others but i thought a way to separate the differences quickly between the five that you've heard so far would be just to take a little section about you know just a few bars into the piece um, around 48 seconds in 
there's a little section go da -e da 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 -e da da and you will hear how each of them tackle that because they tackle that each very very differently let me show you first of all how the doodoc quartet to say it it's really played not staccato but it's straight and and listen to this <laughs> Now let's just listen to that one again. All right, and now let's listen to, for example, Pro Arte. We're going to go right back to 1932. Listen to how they do it. It's it's more slurry if you like how it's put that together. Let's listen to how the traditionalists do it. The Chioscuro Quartet. Here, listen closely. Listen to that again. Listen, it's quite, quite different from all of the others. They've created a kind of wall of sound. That, that, that all of those, it's not staccato at all, like we heard with the doodock, is it? So now we'll move on to the Emerson to see how they handle that exactly same part. Something in between, we could say. And now, lastly, we'll listen to the Lindsay's. But we started this first movement with the Doodot Quartet and I want to go back to them for the ending of the movement and one of the things I've noticed with the Doodot Quartet which I actually quite like it's not a, it's not in any way a criticism what I like about them is that that during the first movement of course they have moments where they're playing louder and quieter but generally they're playing at the same volume whereas um, some of the other quartets have actually increased and increased and increased and you'll see that typically with the Amazon you see it typically with the Lindsay that there's a sort of development as a build as that movement moves on the Doodot quartet don't do that but it's really very appealing to me anyway so now we're going to end the first movement of the Haydn string quartet number five opus 20 with the Doodot Quartet. those two and it's such a lovely introduction towards the second movement because the second movement is a minuet uh, or menuetto um, it's a basically a, a kind of French dance if you like usually in three four time through what is in three three four time um, and we're going to begin with the Chiroscuro Quartet and they're taking this at quite a fast pace if uh, you were a French courtier trying to dance to their pace on this, you would be, yeah, you would have to work. <laughs>
they put all those little accents there. Da 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 ba da da ba. It's very lilting. I'd love to hear them play live. It must be wonderful to to to, to see them play live. Now, let's contrast that with the Doodle Quartet and see how they open the second movement. <laughs> course about the pitch difference again when you when you're moving from the chiaroscuro quartet to the dudok you, and, and the others you, you you've got to go back up a pitch and that's a little bit disconcerting at first but we're in the same pitch now for the for the lindsays uh, um, and what you heard on the dudok as well you got some nice rich tones in the cello didn't you which um is partly to do with the way they've recorded it. I've looked at the microphones closely and they use the one microphone quite low down for the cello, which is a little trick that I do because cellists like to be present. And there are too many recordings of chamber music where the cello is very thin and hasn't got that nice, warm, deep, rich bass that can really help hold the thing together. You hear it when it's live, but often in recordings for whatever reason, it's not done and it's ignored and I find that a shame but so the doodot recording is, is, is great and but the Lindsay's here what I want to emphasize on the cello here you'll notice how the cello is slightly pushing them ahead just like in some rock music when the bass player is right on the beat it just keeps everything tight and moving and creates a sense of energy in the group listen and enjoy <laughs> playing isn't it and now we're going to finish the second movement the minuetto just with the opening section again it, 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 it's this piece is it's a typical sonata form really um, listen to this opening see how you think the Emerson handles it because it there I feel that they have quite a different approach listen <laughs> Fabulous recording. 
It's really rich, it's nice, uh, beautiful playing. But I think we'll leave the, the me menuet, the second movement there. Because the third movement, the adagio, which is in six time, is um, really a stunningly beautiful part of the, of the whole work. And we're going to open that with the Emerson Quartet again because we'll stay in the same mood and, and see how they how they ta tackle this one. piece because you've got this supporting thing when the, and the violin has that those lovely little running melodies but there is a, a danger that the violin can be very scrapey it can be and if you've got a quartet that's not really got a brilliant violinist there uh, or they're late you know late home for their supper and they want to get the thing over sometimes the effect that you can have there is a little bit disappointing listen to the precision of the doodoc quartet <laughs> those silences aren't they Just glorious it I think if Haydn could have heard it because we know that when Haydn and Mozart were fooling around together Haydn used to pick up the violin and Mozart would often play the viola it's just stunning how beautiful that that performance is now you could argue that it's too tame and it should be more aggressive and it should be but I picked this this quartet because yeah this is the the piece that I like to listen to in the evening, you know, with a nice glass of wine and to relax and to really engage with. So that's kind of what I want. Now we're going to introduce to, to you the Jerusalem Quartet. Um, I've held them back because I think this is absolutely, they've got a stunning first movement, but this is a very interesting contrast. This is the Jerusalem Quartet on the beginning of the third movement.
very different, isn't it? You could say it's more elegant in a way, or I don't know. It, I'm running out of words for this one. This is uh, more beautiful, more uh, delicate, more romantic. That's the word. It's probably more romantic, isn't it? Um, let's listen to the ending of this third movement, because I find it kind of a, a, an amusing. And I don't know whether <laughs> Joseph Haydn is playing a little joke with us, because during this piece, in the middle and again at the end, you have this fabulous ending where it goes pom, 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 and you think, OK, that should be the end. But then there's this gap again, and then there's a, a little note, a little interval, and then he ends on two beats. Listen how it's done. It's absolutely brilliant. If it's a joke, it works on both levels because it's keeping you awake and going, oh, but it's also very, very beautiful. It's not interfering at all. Lovely little da da dee da 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 dum in between, and then you've got the boom boom, and that is fabulous because you, you you're not quite sure where that's going to end, and if you were hearing it for the first time, you could be tricked, and it's his way of just keeping you engaged, I think. But it's it's so beautiful. But now, get ready for a drop in pitch because we're going to go back to the chiascoro or chiascoro quartet. Just for that little ending, we're going to pick up roughly around the same place where we did with the Jerusalem. But let's see how they end it. It's magnificent. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? I think we should just hear that again because I think it's just got something very special. It's so delicate. I'm going to turn the volume up a bit. Try again. So that's the end of the third movement. I hope you're enjoying this. Now we're going to start the fourth movement with the Pro Arti Quartet from 1932. I think it's really interesting here because again, obviously mono, but listen to the detail of every single instrument in the fugue. And you realise that although we go on and on about separation and soundstage in stereo, it can sound equally magnificent in mono. Just listen to this. quality is not for everyone. But you hear all the instruments very clearly and I don't know if it was recorded with an electronic microphone or, or it was just a mechanical horn. I think it, my guess is it's a mechanical and not, not electronic. Please correct me if you know better. Anyway, let's go back to the Chioscuro Quartet. So we're going to go down to the 4-3-2 tuning and onto the 
ancient instrument, so get ready for that. And see how they start this wonderful fugue. much slower of course and you wonder whether it's too slow it gives a, a certain elegance and beauty to it and the Chiascoro or Chiascoro name comes from uh, a ta an Italian term for light and dark um, it was a particular fashion and it's in, in the I think in the 17th century where you would have very dark backgrounds to the paintings and then the subject in full light it's it's it's, it's a, a beautiful thing and in, in a way you can say that hopper uh, goes back to that in a less extreme way but it's, it's an interesting thing but i think we should listen to the lindsay's now because the lindsay's opening you get a, a sense of precision and yet fun if the chioscoro are going for sort of a religious kind of um ephemeral beauty the Lindsay's are kind of going come on let's go for it listen to this <laughs> it's much lighter it's more fun and maybe at the end of a concert if this is the last piece they're going to play in the whole evening's repertoire this ending would suit very nicely so if it just really depends what mood you're in doesn't it because each of these quartets are very very capable musicians so they're just choosing how they're going to do it, it, it it's not a question of what they're capable of it's what they're choosing to do Listen to the doodok, and, and in this one, you'll notice that they are really fast here because they've been very, very, very precise. So there's a risk here. If they play this too fast, they could trip on themselves. <laughs> maintain a lovely delicacy and there's no hint of it being too fast not for me anyway well this leaves us the Emerson doesn't it now the Emerson quartet how are they going to handle this? They are considered to be one of the world's greatest quartets, certainly of their time. Listen to how they take on the fugue. They really 
do pl play those accents, don't they? Ever so often you'll hear them go, da -da 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 -da. just one of the instruments, just really forcing the first note to create some emphasis and some excitement in, in, in the piece. And what is also interesting, I think, when you're comparing these different quartets is not only the difference of the recording, but also the difference of the sound that they're creating, the sound of their instruments. Some of it may be down to the types of microphones or, or the acoustics of the hall, but they're remarkably different sound, aren't they? Um, and let's just... The question with a, a fugue is always how do you end it? And I don't mean how does the composer end it, it's how does the quartet end it? Because it's like a, a race towards sort of madness and at the end you're going to hit this wall and you're going to have to play your last two notes um, and if you go too mad and you build and you build and you build you can get to the point when you're pulling on the last two notes especially bearing in mind that these are stringed instruments you can pull too hard and the actual instruments can distort um, because of it or you can just sound of make a very harsh and almost unpleasant ending now, again, I hasten to say that none of them have done that here, but they've got close at times. Let's just listen to the, the Lindsay's ending, the, uh, ending this piece. <laughs> really precise and they'd kind of built up to that volume to be honest and that was a nice progression up um, let's listen to Dudok listen how different it is it's almost as if it's been written by a different composer <laughs> It's quite incredible, isn't it? So anyway, to end this little talk or long talk on the fifth string quartet from Haydn, from Opus 20, I'm going to close with the Jerusalem uh, just about two minutes in towards the end. Now, what is interesting here to pick up on maybe is to listen out for that long cello note in the bass and then you'll hear the cello take over and lead the fugue. And this is something which is just wonderful to hear. And for a cello player, it's like saying, great, finally, we are now taking the lead in these things and we are on the equal level to the other musicians. Because you can imagine the discussions that go on in a string quartet between the four players about how they should play it, faster, slower, warmer, more staccato, less staccato, more legato. I mean, all of these things, these heavy discussions, and there will be a dominance and, and, a, and, a, and a nagging, a tendency, as in the English, uh, towards a, 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 a a performance and then of course afterwards someone will criticize and say, oh, but you should have done it like this you should have done it like that and then the viola player will nudge the chalice and see see i told you so there's always this discussion and that's what makes music so wonderful and that's why going to hear music live is so fabulous because you never know quite what you're going to get this is the jerusalem quartet ending this talk um, and i hope you enjoy it <laughs> Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.
Enjoy the music. Thank you. 